Evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, this evening's service at Wheelock Heath Baptist Church. If it's your first time here, don't see anyone, but uh, maybe watching at home. My name's Tim, one of the leaders here at the church. And it's great having you with us. Um, if you've got a Bible with you, why don't you turn to Psalm 56? Psalm 56. Uh, this is another Psalm of David when he's in a really tight spot, a really difficult spot. Um, we're told at the start um, that it's when the Philistines had seized him in Gath. And uh, we see here him bringing, as we've seen in a couple of these psalms in recent weeks, just bringing the things that concern him to God. And it's a good encouragement for us to do the same. So Psalm 56. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? All day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for my ruin. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps hoping to take my life. Because of their wickedness, do not let them escape. In your anger, God, bring the nations down. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your records? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid, what can man do to me? I am under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. I don't know how you're feeling as you come here tonight, whether there's any tears on the scroll of your life as you come this evening. Uh, but we can bring all those things to God, can't we? We can put our trust in him. And let's do that as we sing our first song, which talks about the perfect wisdom of our God in all the trials of life. Uh, let's stand and sing to the praise of God together, shall we?
Let's pray, shall we? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you um, that all the sorrows of our life have that place within your tapestry of grace. Uh, Father, we thank you that whatever we may be going through, you have your hand even on that, even in the midst of that, and using it for good. Lord, we thank you that we can rely on your wisdom as we come to you in prayer. And Father, we do pray uh, this evening as we come to your word, as we uh, grow in understanding of it, Lord, that you would speak clearly to us and that we begin to see something more of what your purpose is behind all your many ways. Father, we thank you um, for many churches in our area that uh, proclaim the good news of Jesus. Uh, we do thank you for our friends at Christ Church Wharton. Uh, we thank you for the faithful proclamation that's gone on there over many years. And we do pray for uh, Tim and the team there um, that as they uh, preach the gospel, uh, and particularly uh, take it out to the surrounding areas, that you would uh, bear fruit uh, through that ministry. And Lord, we pray over um, the summer period um, that whatever it may be they're doing, if they're doing holiday clubs or um, involved in outreach, that you would uh, use that to your glory. Father, we thank you for the Ministry of Explorers. We thank you um, for the, um, the ongoing group that there is there. Uh, Father, as we were asked to pray for in the annual reports, we do pray for some of those kids who are now getting at the age where they need to move on to YP um, and maybe leave the explorers behind. We pray that would be a smooth transition. We pray that no kids would be lost between. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would be uh, keeping hold of those kids so that throughout their lives they can be growing in understanding of your word. We do pray for um, new kids to come in from the local area um, we pray that um, maybe there'd be some girls coming in to address the balance there. And we do pray particularly for the leaders. Father, as in any organisation, there's people coming straight off the end of work or about to go on to evening shifts straight after having uh, uh, being at Explorers. We thank you for the sacrifice that is. I think of many times that they'll have turned up tired and wanting to be anywhere else. We thank you for that faithfulness. Uh, and we pray that you would uh, take their faithful labour, and use it for your glory. We also thank you for the Gilmores, Father. Uh, we thank you for the work that they've done in Palermo over many years. Do you pray as they seek out a, um, a, a new uh, staff worker to work alongside them, um, that you would uh, help them to find uh, the right man and um, that the work would be uh, growing and uh, able to continue uh, as a result of what is done. And Lord, we pray that you'd bless them both. Uh, we know it's been a tough two years to be starting a new church and um, having had COVID to contend with for so long. Lord, we pray that you'd sustain them and encourage them and help them to persevere in the midst of these challenges. And Lord, now as we come to your word, we pray that you would open our ears to be able to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we have the reading, just two things. I can't remember whether this was mentioned this morning, but if it wasn't, I'll say it again. It says, uh, many thanks to all, including those uh, watching at home who've delivered the summer flyers around Winterley and Haslington. It's all done now, so thank you uh, for doing that. Okay, you've still got some to Let's go on, Ross. Okay, there are some more to be done, so don't, don't be thanked by this. Feel like you need to do some more. <laughs> I'm going to speak to Howard or Ross uh, if, you're, if you're able to do that. Uh, the other thing is, this is very short notice, but um, once a month, uh, Roger Carswell does a, a thing with praying with a missionary at 8.15. And tonight, quite short notice, it's Jonathan Gilmore. So if any of you are able to do that, it's on Zoom. I should probably mention that. Come and see me afterwards and I'll give you the Zoom details. It's, it's hard to do it any other way um, if, you, if you're interested in that. Um, it'd be good to find out what Jonathan's doing and be able to pray with people across the country um, some of you may have been part of that for the um, Ukraine. Um, there was a, a missionary in Ukraine who spoke that. Anyway, if you're interested in that, come and speak to me afterwards. I only found out about that today, so that's why it's uh, so last minute. It's not me being disorganised for once. Um, so uh, if you're interested in that, do let me know. Uh, Janet's now going to come and read to us Psalm 103. Thank you, Janet.
Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost most being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as, the high, high, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, The Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Amen. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Well, we're going to be thinking about the love of God in a few moments' time, uh, but we're going to start... um, by singing, well not start, we're going to continue uh, by singing what love could remember, uh, his mercy is more. So let's stand and sing the praise of God together.
Um, well, there's some parts of God's character that are a bit of a hard sell, aren't they? Um, ones that we've done over the past few weeks that you might have started the sermon and thought, hmm, not sure what I think of impassibility. I'm not sure that's a really good thing. Or maybe having to wrestle with God's sovereignty. Is it really a good thing that God's in control of everything? Or perhaps in being a spirit might make him feel really distant. But the love of God is something everyone wants a part of, don't they? Who wouldn't want to believe in a God that loves us? But there are different kinds of love, aren't there? I could say, I love Nat, I love my kids, and I love Yorkshire puddings. And all those three things would be true, uh, but it wouldn't be a very good thing if I loved Nat in the same way that I loved Yorkshire puddings. There's a very big difference there, isn't there? And that is worth thinking about as we come to the love of God, because a lot of us assume we know what it means for God to love us. But what kind of love does God have for us? Is it a parental love? A Yorkshire pudding love? The kind of love where you know you have to do it, but you're not really enthusiastic about it. A bit like when the reception teacher says, we're all friends, even though you've just had a fight with little Johnny outside. What does the Bible mean when it says God loves us? Well, here's the description of God's love from our church's confession, which is really beautiful. And we're just going to basically work through this and show it in the Bible. It says this, God is most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. God's most loving, number one. Gracious, number two. Merciful, number three. Long-suffering, number four. Abundant in goodness and truth, number five. And forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, number six. Those are six aspects we're going to think about tonight in turn. So let's go through them now. And I hope that as we look at these things, we'll begin to understand what it means when we say God loves us. Well, let's start with most loving. The key word there is most. Whilst the Bible might say that God's love is like the love for a, fa- a father has for his child, or like the love a husband has for his wife, his love is always far greater than any metaphor we can imagine. He has a category-blowing love. His love is unlimited, we're told in the Bible. And we talked about that recently. Ephesians 3, verses 17 to 19, Paul prays that the Ephesians, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. This love surpasses knowledge. It is so great that it cannot be fully understood. But it goes even further than that. God's love has existed before even time itself. Jesus prays in John 17, 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Before there was time, before there was space, before there was anything other than God, there was love. Because God the Father loved God the Son in the Holy Spirit. There has always been love. And God's love is also great because it's uncaused. He doesn't love because of something lovable in the other person. He loves generously out from himself, not based on anything. So, for example, he says this, In regard to Israel, the Lord did not set his affection on you, Israel, and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Why did he do that? Rescue that redemption? Because the Lord loved you. There was no other reason. They weren't big, they weren't significant, they weren't impressive. God just loved them. 
And it's the same with the church. In Ephesians 1, he, Paul says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. He predestined before the world began. He chose to love his church just out of love. Not out of anything they'd done. They hadn't done anything yet. The world hadn't even begun yet. He loved them because he loved them. God's love is uncaused. It's not motivated by anything in the person. But we can go even greater than that because John says that God is love. He's not just loving. He is the very definition of what love is. So his love trumps all other loves. And that's important because often, especially if you've grown up in a church, God's love just sounds a bit meh. It's the kind of thing that we just talk about again and again and again. God loves you. God loves you. And we don't really grasp how amazing it is. I remember speaking to a young woman once who was struggling because She'd had to give up a relationship with a man who she was attracted to, but he wasn't a Christian and he wanted wrong things for her. And she'd given up that love. But it was difficult because to her, the love of that man felt a lot more real and solid and good than God's love. God's love felt like a bit of a consolation prize. You know, like when you've not got a gold, silver or bronze at sports day and they give you a little sticker at the end. God loves you, even if that guy can't love you. But if she'd have only realised that God's love was so much greater, he'd loved her always and always would. His love wasn't inspired by something attractive in her. Even her unattractive qualities he saw and was able to love beyond them, which this man might never have done. Giving up that relationship was a massive sacrifice, and I don't want to dumb that down and say it would have been fine if she'd had a good understanding of God. The more she recognised the amazing love of God, the easier it was to make that sacrifice. Now, all the other words are really just different ways of getting to grasp what that most loving love is. So we go on secondly to God being gracious. Uh, Many of you will have learnt that kid's song. Grace is when God gives us the things we don't deserve. Do you still do that at Wheelers or anything like that? No? Is there no one else who sings that song? Okay. Well, you need to learn that song because it's a really good explanation of grace. Grace is when God gives us the things we don't deserve. Um, That's what it means, God giving us something that we don't deserve. Uh, As it says in Psalm 103, verse 10, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Now, there's two aspects to that uh, that theologians talk about. They talk about common grace and special grace. God's common grace is him being gracious to humanity as a whole. It's common because everyone has it. Human beings deserve only punishment for their sins. And that's what, of course, many will get. But even those who are going to get that eternal punishment still experience many blessings in this life. They have the beauty and blessings of the natural world. Jesus says God makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Even Richard Dawkins, as he rails against God, can look out and see a beautiful sunrise, Uh, can eat food that has been given because rain fell to make the crops grow. God gives creativity to all sorts of people. So in the Bible, some of Cain's evil family line, the kids will probably remember Cain, who was the man that we learned about recently, killed his brother, Some of his descendants did some amazing things. So uh, Jubal invented string instruments and pipes. Zillah forged tools. Um, There were fantastic um, scientists and, and brilliant musicians all throughout history who were given gifts from God, even though they don't use them to worship God. And there's also a general morality that means each person who has a conscience which restrains them from doing evil. And God gives governments, uh, which, though imperfect, do punish some of the most extreme crimes in our world. They don't totally remove sin, but they make the world a happier place for every human being, whether they believe in God or not. That's God's common grace. We don't deserve any of those things in our world, but God gives us them anyway. 
But of course, God's greatest grace is towards those who believe. The whole of our salvation from start to finish is a gift of God's grace. So Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And they are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. In Romans 11, he says, if it is by grace that we're saved, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Everything we have in the Christian life is from grace. Now, grace isn't just for the start of the Christian life, then. In fact, the Christians used to use grace as a greeting to each other. So they'd say grace to you instead of hi or hello or whatever. And the point there was, may God give to you what you don't deserve again and again and again. They were recognizing that all that they needed in their life came from God's grace. They were loved before the creation of the world by God's grace. They were declared innocent in God's sight by his grace, adopted as sons and daughters by his grace, having the spirit giving gifts and and helping them to fight sin by grace. From start to finish, everything in the Christian life was by grace. Now, some of you in this room probably doubt that you could be accepted by God. Perhaps you think, for decades, I've rejected God and his call to me in Jesus. Why would he accept me now? Or you might have been following him, but you've failed. And you might think, well, maybe God at this point is going to stop forgiving me. Now, human beings, we change all the time, but God doesn't. It is his character to be gracious. It is his character to give gifts that aren't deserved. If you call out to God to have grace, he always will. Because that is his generous nature. He gives us things we don't deserve. So that's God's uh, graciousness. And then thirdly, we have God being merciful. Now, God's mercy is similar to his graciousness, but sometimes we kind of merge the two together. And there is a bit of a distinction When God's merciful, it's usually when he's relieving the suffering of his people. He's responding to the misery of his people. So, for example, the blind man in Mark 10, 47 says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, he's not saying in that particular instance, forgive me my sin. What he's saying is, Lord, I'm suffering as a result of being blind. I need your help. Think about um, the old times... uh, king sat in his throne and a beggar might come up to him uh, and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Uh, That would be an expectation of help in suffering. Now, there are times in the Bible where the suffering that is being experienced is because of sin. And that's why these two things kind of get mixed together. Um, And so uh, we'll think about that in a second. But just one more thing. I've just uh, realized I've not mentioned something. Paul talks of his suffering as the far, uh, as, and praise to the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. So we can go to God in that mercy. And uh, in Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, we're told that we can have confidence before the throne of God above that we may find mercy and grace in our times of need. Uh, anyway, I was saying mercy is used in the context of sin. Uh, and ex- for example of that, David sinned against God by getting proud and, and counting all the people. Uh, And he says to a prophet, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. He sinned and he can expect punishment and suffering as a result, but he expects that God will have compassion, that God will have mercy on him in his suffering. Now, you might turn around and say, well, hang on, there's been plenty of times in my life where I've cried out to God for mercy, but it doesn't come. Why is that? Well, we need to remember a few things about God's character. Firstly, God is eternal. So he has quite a different time scale to us. Maybe the answer will come in a month or in a year. Certainly, we are told in the new heavens and the new earth, he will wipe every tear from our eye. For a Christian, we know that every suffering will be taken away. God will take pity on us in his time, his eternal time scale. Secondly, we also know that God is all-knowing. He knows more than us. 
And sometimes he can see things which we can't. Imagine a child uh, being given some nasty medicine by their parents. And they writhe and they kick and they beg their parents not to give them the medicine again. But their parent would persevere because they know that it's actually more merciful to give them the medicine and take away the illness than it would be to remove it. So God is merciful. We might not always know in what way he's being merciful towards us, but he always has mercy. Part of the reason uh, why I read a psalm at the beginning of every service is I want us to learn the language to speak to God when we're suffering. Like the psalm we read at the start. Uh, That man talking about how God has kept his tears in a scroll. We look at the hardness of life, but we still can turn to God knowing that he will have mercy in the suffering we're going through. Whether we deserved it as a result of sin or whether it's just the general suffering of life. God is a merciful God. The next thing that's mentioned is long suffering. Now, we learned a few weeks back that God doesn't really suffer in the same way that human beings do. Uh, A lot of modern translations in the Bible won't say long suffering. They'll say patience or a word that comes up in Psalm 103, slow to anger. God's goodness uh, includes him withholding punishment over a long period of time to give people a chance to repent. God could have judged humanity the second Eve ate that forbidden fruit, couldn't he? But he's been patient, and he's patient to this point still. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I don't know about you, but I'd love it if we could just skip to the end right now. If we could just get to that eternity of joy that is awaiting us. But God is being patient to give everyone a chance to repent. The classic example of God's patience is how he responded to Israel. Think of what we saw this morning. And we see it time and time again. God recounting the history of Israel. And Israel fail and fail and fail and fail. And God has mercy, has mercy, has mercy, has mercy. He forgives them time and time again. He's patient with them for the long haul. And he's patient with us too. God's aware of all the sins that are in our heart from the start of our Christian lives. But I think most of us would acknowledge that thankfully, God didn't make us aware of all our sinfulness the day we were saved. And thank goodness for that. He slowly chipped away at piece by piece by piece. And we may wander away from the truth. We may go backwards in our faith. But he's patient enough to forgive us and to bring us back to him. Never think that God's going to grow tired with you and just give up as you on you as if you're a, you're a bit too much hard work. He's not like a child who starts a jigsaw with enthusiasm and then 10 minutes later decides they want to move on to something else. He knows that healing your sin is a long-term project The growing you in faith is a long-term project, and he's committed for the long haul. By the way, that should shape the way that we respond to others in the church as well, shouldn't it? Sometimes a new person will come in, they've just become a Christian, and because they've just become a Christian, they've got the baggage of a whole life of sin that needs to be unpacked, that needs to be dealt with. And the temptation for those who've been Christian for a while might be to shout at them and tell them, do this, do that, do the other, rather than have the patience to know that God's slowly and surely going to deal with the sin in their lives. Other times, we might have more experienced Christians, and we think, why can't you get over this by now? But instead, we're to be patient as God is with us. I often find it uh, helpful to think that through in my own life. I might be annoyed at someone who's constantly negative. And then look at my own life and think, well, I've been pretty negative throughout my many years and God's been a bit patient with me. Maybe I should respond in the same way uh, to this friend. So God is patient. Fifthly, God is abundant in goodness and truth. That word abundant is fantastic, isn't it? 
Uh, it's a picture of a tree. And it's not like you're looking at it and there's the odd grape here and the odd grape there. It's just full, bursting full of grapes. It's abundant. And that's the way God is with goodness and truth. There's not a little bit of goodness here and there. It's bursting out of him. We'll start with goodness. Now, if there are any primary school teachers like me or kids, you'll know that you're not really meant to say good in primary schools. Good is a boring word, we're told. So you should say amazing or brilliant or fantastic. Well, if that's how you want to think of it, that's fine. The goodness of God is the amazingness, the brilliance, the fantasticness of God. Uh, The psalmist tells us in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is is good. How do you describe delicious food? It's quite hard to do, isn't it? You can't really describe something. You just say to the other person, have a taste of this. It's fantastic. How do you describe the beauty of a view? Even a photo doesn't quite do it, does it? You need to be up there. You need to stare out at the view and drink it in. You need to taste food. You need to see a view. And it's the same with God. His goodness is is better tasted than described. The more you experience it, the more that you're blown away by it. Good means that he he does what is right. But as well as getting across that he does what is right, it gets across the fact that it's wonderful what he does. Uh, James tells us every good and perfect gift is from above. Anything good in your life is from him. Your relationship, your food, your garden, your work, your holidays. All that is good in those things comes from God and God alone. But it's not just that God does good things. He is the definition of good. As Jesus says, no one is good but God alone. You and I may do occasional good things. Not on the scale of God, but occasional. But we aren't the definition of goodness itself. Now that helps us when we're trying to figure out what good is. In every generation, there's a sort of reconsidering what is the good life? What does it mean to be right morally and to experience the joy of life? And sometimes we look at God's commands and we say, no, that isn't a good command. Or we look at God's character and we say, no, that isn't a good thing. And we might be tempted to change what God says about himself or about his law to fit our definition of good. But we've got to remember, we're the sinners. We're the ones who've ruined the world. We don't know what good means. We're like a little girl who uh, gives up a diamond ring for a plastic necklace because it looks a bit more shiny. We don't know what genuine beauty is. But God is the expert. He's like the jewellery expert who can put that diamond under his microscope and tell you how amazing it is. What is good and what is evil? He should be the one to set the agenda. What about truth? Well, God is not only a truthful person, but everything he says is true and reliable. It is the basis of all of the truth. Jesus says in a prayer to God, your word is truth. Uh, Proverbs 30 verse 5 says that every word of God proves true. And that means that we can trust what God says. That's particularly talked about in the Bible of believing God's promises, trusting those promises. So, for example, Hebrews 6 says, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what it was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. God cannot lie. So when he promises to save us, it is an anchor for our soul. It is firm and secure. We're not going to get to heaven and then Jesus say to us, oh, sorry, I was kind of going a bit over the top when I said your sin could be forgiven. I meant kind of reasonably decent people, not people like you. No, if God's promised something, if he said something, you can take it as truth. And that motivates us to be telling the truth to one another. Colossians 3 verse 9 says, do not lie to each other. 
since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. If God is truthful, then as we are renewed, we're made in his image, not lying, not telling falsity, but proclaiming the truth clearly and lovingly to one another. Finally, God's love leads him to forgive sin. Forgiving sin is one of the key parts of God's love. So if you've still got Psalm 103 open, look at verse 9. It says, He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. How far is the east from the west? Well, they're infinitely far from each other, aren't they? They extend as far as possible. And that is how far our sin is from us, if we've trusted in God. That's the level of forgiveness he brings. The New Testament constantly testifies to the fact that God's love is most displayed in the fact that through Jesus, our sin has been forgiven. So, for example, Romans 5, verse 8 says this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, still going against God, Jesus died so our sin could be forgiven. That's how we know what love is, because Jesus died for us. Or 1 John 4, verses 9 to 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. John says, if you want to know what love is, don't look at us. Our love for God ebbs and flows. Look at his love for us. Look at the way that he gave the Lord Jesus so that we could have our sins forgiven. Now, someone might say, well, why can't he just forgive if he loves us so much? Well, we learned a few um, weeks ago, maybe even months ago, uh, that God's character is one. He's not split up into a bit of love and a bit of justice. God is one. And so part of his love for the universe is justice. Sin has to be paid for. But at the same time, God loves sinners, and there needs to be a solution for that. God can't just say, oh, let's forget about it. He has to deal with love, and the decision he made to deal with love was that he, or at least God the Son, became a human being to bear the penalty for sin. And that act is the greatest act of love that there will ever be. Now, as we close, I want you to consider, what have you done with God's love? Perhaps you've rejected it. Uh, perhaps you've assumed that it's just like any other love, or that there's better loves out there. If that's you, I'd ask you to consider the things that we've gone through today. Is there any love like this? Perhaps you haven't rejected God's love, but you've doubted it. You keep looking at yourself and thinking, there's no way God could love someone like me. But that's not the way God loves he doesn't look at someone and say, wow, they're a wonderful specimen. No. He looks on the most sinful and wretched and loves them in a way they don't deserve. So it would be ridiculous to think he could not love someone like you because that's the very nature of God. That's who he is. He loves despicable, sinful people just like you and me. Perhaps you haven't doubted God's love, but you've neglected it. Many of us have heard God loves you week after week, the entire of our lives since we were children, and it maybe rings a bit hollow. Well, that's why we need to be in God's word regularly, and we need to be asking God to re-amaze us with God's love, to show us new depths of God's love, that we might have a greater sense of this love that surpasses knowledge. Perhaps a suggestion of the biggest application of this sermon would be to pray the prayer that we read Paul praying before, that you might pray, that you may have power 
together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how high and long and wide and deep is the love of God, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Let's sing about God's amazing love, shall we, in our last song, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, To him be glory 
in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever.